Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. I'm Brian Warren. And I'm Laurel and Tyler Thompson. It's great to be with you. We have a special week planned for you as we journey across the globe to the land of the Bible, Israel. According to the Hebrew calendar, this week marks 70 years of Israel's <laughs> independence, which became official after a declaration was signed in secret in Tel Aviv in 1948. Mm -hmm. There's a special place in our hearts for the people of Israel. Yeah, there sure is. One of the highlights for me was the trip that we took, uh, you know, with the entire crew of the 700 Club Canada, and that was outrageous. For me, that was my first trip. Mm -hmm. Now, I've gone. Uh, so I'm, many times you can't I'm count. I'm into around 20 something oh, now, wow. right? But it's each time that I go, it's like the first time that I've ever been. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of the land itself, you know, it says in Isaiah 35 that the, the desert shall bloom. Yeah. And every time I look at that and I see the, yeah. the, the life that has come back out of that yes. desert land, and, and most people would look at it and they said, can the desert really bloom? Right. That's prophecy being fulfilled. I remember us sitting there, uh, we were about to tape and we were on some rocks beside the, the Jordan River. Yes. And uh, just thinking, am I really here at yes. the Jordan yes. River yes. that I've read all those stories about? You know, it was just John absolutely. baptizing, Jesus oh. being baptized, the Holy Amazing. Spirit coming down. Yes. Oh, just to be there. It was, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's hard to describe. It really is. It is. So let's uh, head there now and enjoy this story about the ancient land. Take a look. Much of the world only knows Israel from what it sees on television news or reads on the web. That typically includes images of violence and words like oppressed. But what's it really like in Israel? Based on what the news media shows, many wouldn't expect to see shopping, restaurants, and people going about their daily lives. For example, this is the Manila Mall, just outside the walls of the old city. It's a combination of restaurants, shops, and cafes. We talk with first-time tourists about their perception before leaving and the reality they experienced after their arrival. What did people say to you when you told them you're going to come to Israel? They questioned it. They said, do you really want to do that? Is it safe? Did they say you were crazy? That was a <laughs> very common comment. Are you crazy? <laughs> and I said, no. You know, nothing was going to stop me. You know, people couldn't talk me out of it, uh -huh. so. And, and how did you feel before you came? What was it like? A little, uh, probably a little apprehensive, but excited. You know, we just couldn't wait to see where Christ has walked. And it was more than I expected. It was amazing. Some felt coming to Israel might send a message in fighting back against the growth of terrorism. I had some friends who said, why don't you come along? And I thought, oh, I'm not sure I should. It, it it's, might be a little dangerous. And then I thought, goodness, life is dangerous, really. I came from the Boston Marathon. I mean, there's so much going on that what? I'm not going to worry about it. If you stop moving, the bad guys win. It's ridiculous. Tuvia Zaretsky arranged their tour with an eye on ancient history and current events. I told him I wanted to come over here and look at the, the world that's here and the people that are here and the places where these, the Bible events took place. And for them, it has been an eye-opening experience. And it's in the context of Israel today. Samuel Smaja has led tours here for more than 20 years. Israel doesn't come in the category of tourist destination. Israel is not the Bahamas. Israel is not even Paris. Israel is not even Rome. I believe Israel is the stage of your faith. And I believe coming to Israel will encourage you in your walking with the Lord. And what was it like after these tourists made their leap of faith to come to Israel? The Israelis really have their act do. together. Really felt do. very comfortable. The people are wonderful. They're very professional. They're very caring. And uh, they really want to make us feel welcome. It's a very sophisticated, cosmopolitan city. So when we got here, there was such a peace. I, the whole time we've been here, I have never felt not safe. And they did know Israel has been experiencing its own wave of terror. They told us there are places you definitely don't want to go, yes. but there are places in any city in the United States you don't want to go to. Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat told CBN News, despite the current violence, Jerusalem is a safer city than most. We have the best police in the world. We have the best security forces per capita. The, we're as safe as London when you really check the numbers. So actually, when I fly to America, I pray to come back home safely to Jerusalem 
because the crime rates in America are six times more per capita than in Jerusalem. And how did these Christian pilgrims feel after walking in the footsteps of Jesus? Oh, it was quite moving. It brought me to tears a few times. There's not another feeling like walking where Christ has walked. I don't think I'll ever read the Bible the same way anymore. Yes. I, I've been so moved by being here. I would not trade it for, for anything. And I felt the Lord with me through this trip, and he's been speaking to my heart and doing good work in there. And uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything either. I'm so glad I came. It also brought the Bible to life. For me, it really tied the Old Testament and the New Testament together in ways that I could not have done had I not come here and seen the geography and appreciated the history. I really believe that after you come to Israel, you'll never be the same for several reasons. First of all, you'll read the Bible in a different understanding. You'll be able to visual whatever you read, and you'll be able to understand the Jewish Christian background of the Word of God, and you'll see how deep your faith is. And my prayer is that when you come to Israel, you will leave here praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. I love that statement. Israel is not the Bahamas, it's not Paris, and it's not Rome. Right, you know? right. And it is definitely the truth. You might find the Eiffel Tower, you might even look at uh, the, the place of the Colosseum and in the Bahamas, those pink beaches and everything. But when you come to the land of the Bible, yes. you actually come to the place of the birthplace of the Messiah and the place where we will have the final chapter of humanity. Yes. Well, you know, Tel Aviv now is just like a big city and it's uh, bustling and, yes. you know, more of a secular place, right? But then when you travel, as I found, into some of these, uh, you know, these distant communities, communities. Places, yeah, yes. absolutely beautiful. And Nazareth, that still seems like, you know, yeah. how it might have been. We went through that it really does. little place. I, I love what uh, the mayor says, uh, Mayor uh, near Briquet. He says, I feel like when I go to the U.S., it's more dangerous. And uh, he yes. said, when I come here, I feel much safer when well, I'm in Jerusalem. I sure Jerusalem. felt safe, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Even though there were some things going on and, and uh, you know, when we were there with the 700 Club Canada crew, they yes. actually uh, shut down the, the Temple Mount because there had been yeah. some incident. But... For the most part, uh, we just went wherever we liked, and it was this beautiful sense of absolute peace. Yeah, and you got to get involved with it as well. So many times people are boycotting because they hear this and that, but when you begin to understand the significance of Israel, then you begin to say, no, let's pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Yeah. And you pray for that every day. He said, may they prosper who love you, mm. the God of Jerusalem. After the break, we revisit our amazing time with Ziev Orenstein, the international director of the City of David. You won't want to miss this. Mm -hmm. This is Israel, the land of the Bible, and we want you to experience it for yourself with this one-of-a-kind DVD. For this week only, in celebration of the 70th anniversary of Israel's independence, the 700 Club Canada is offering you this free teaching DVD, In His Footsteps. Journey with us as we take you to the places that Jesus walked, taught, and performed many of his miracles. See the incredible view from the Mount of Beatitudes and take a walk around the Garden Tomb. All you have to do is call 1-855-759-0700 today, and you can share in those life-changing messages. It's our free gift to you for celebrating with us. Let's get a sense now of both where we are and when we are. Mm. Mm. If we look to the north, we have the famous Mount Moriah, the yes. Temple Mount. Uh, we see before us the gray dome, the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Behind it is the Dome of the Rock. Yes. When we talk about the Dome of the Rock, the rock that's being referred to, according to Jewish tradition, that is the foundation stone. That is the place where all of creation emanated. Literally, it is the center of the world. Wow. That is the place where, according to the Bible, Abraham binds Isaac. That's the place where David's son Solomon will build the holy temple. It's destroyed after about 450 years by the Babylonians yes. and then is rebuilt yes. by Ezra and Nehemiah, mm. refurbished or renovated by Herod, and later destroyed by the Romans in the year 70. Wow. That all happens over there mm -hmm. on Mount Moriah. Now we have the walls just outside, the old city walls. Yes. 
Now, many people believe that the old city walls are in fact thousands of years old because <laughs> Jerusalem is thousands of years yes. old. But the old city, while it's old, it's not that old. The right. walls are only... It's not the ancient city. Exactly, it's not the ancient I've city. I've learned that. There you go. <laughs> These walls are only 450 years wow. old. Yeah. Now, where we're standing is almost 4,000 years old. So we don't get wow. that excited about 450 years. <laughs> they were built by Suleiman the Magnificent of yes. the Ottoman Empire. Now, what's interesting is that when he builds the walls around Jerusalem, yes. he leaves out the ancient biblical city of Jerusalem, the city of David, where we are wow. right now. He leaves it out. Mount Zion. Mount Zion. He leaves it out. So now, if we look to the east, we have yes. the famous Mount Olives, right? Wow. That today you have on the Mount of Olives over 150,000 Jews who are buried there. Yes. Going back 2,600 years up until today, it's the longest active Jewish cemetery in the world. In the Bible, when David is fleeing from his son Absalom, yes. he goes down from the city of David into yes. the Kidron Valley, climbs up the slopes mm. of the Mount of Olives, he turns back to Jerusalem, back to Mount Moriah, wow. and he bows down crying. He's running away from the city that he built, from the son that he loves. He's running away. He doesn't know if he'll ever come back. He turns and he, he says goodbye. Wow. And that was wow. on, on Mount of Olives. Exactly. Yes. And right how do, who can be buried on the Mount of Olives today? Like uh, People. Anyone? I mean, yeah, people can be buried. It's, it's, a, it's a Jewish cemetery, but yeah. people who want to be buried there, uh, there are many, many notable people throughout history. So there are a lot of people who they want to be buried in such a significant place. And I'll tell you another reason. People wonder, why do so many people want to be buried there? Over 150,000 people. Yeah. In the end of days, according mm -hmm. to Jewish tradition, there's going to be what's called Tchiat Metim, the resurrection of the dead. That's right. And the people buried on the Mount of Olives come back first. So, yeah. so if you were, I er, want to be buried. Right. There. So if you're an early adopter type, uh, that you already have the newest iPhone or whatever, right. then you're the type of person who wants to be buried Is on the Mount of Olives. Jews? Well, you don't want to be buried there right uh, now. Not right now. Uh, that's not today. actually the place where Jesus, uh, according to Christian tradition, his feet are going to touch down on the Mount of Olives. It's going to split, huh. and he is going to fight from from Jerusalem. So. Uh, Come on, Amazing. tell us a little bit more. This okay. is so fascinating. Okay, so now if we go to the south, yes. right, yes. we have the ridge of Armon Hanatziv. Mm -hmm. And one of the most difficult to understand chapters in the Bible takes place there. We're talking about the book of Genesis, chapter 25. Yes. Yeah. God speaks to Abraham. It says, Abraham, I want you to take your son, yeah. your only son, the son that you love, Isaac. And I want you to bring him to the land of Moriah. Wow. Behind us is Mount Moriah. Right. He's living in Beersheba in the south. Wow. He goes on a three-day journey. Yes. And it says on the third day of that journey, he is able to see the place from afar. Mm -hmm. Now, topographically speaking, the first place that Abraham and Isaac would have been able to see Mount Moriah wow. was from this ridge over here. So imagine for a minute. Abraham and Isaac, 3,800 years ago, are standing on that ridge, and the Bible says that Isaac turns to his father yes. and says, Dad, where's the sheep? Yeah. Where's what are we going to sacrifice? Where, right, where's the sacrifice? And, and Abraham says, don't worry. Don't worry. God, God will provide. God will provide, exactly. And at that point, <laughs> yes. probably Isaac begins to... He didn't to, know it was going to be him. Exactly. At the moment, yeah. They come down the slopes here, walk through the Kidron Valley, up the slopes, of Mount Moriah. This wow. is actually... This is the place. We're in the path where wow. Abraham was walking with on us. his way to, with his promise in his hand exactly. to sacrifice. Exactly. Wow. Now, I don't want you guys to be nervous or, or your viewers at home to be nervous, so spoiler alert. Well, I, okay. I'm carrying Laura Lynn that way just in case you guys right. want to know, so yeah. I'm the bigger one. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> but, probably you'll win, yeah. So this is a little spoiler alert. Yeah. Yeah. Abraham doesn't sacrifice Isaac. It works out in the end. Right. Right? God did provide, it's and there was a ram up there, ending. so we're all right. Yeah. If we go now to the west, yes. we have the famous Mount Zion mm -hmm. and the rest of the old city. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to share with you something personal. Mm -hmm. Yes. I grew up in New Jersey, mm -hmm. and I went to Hebrew school, right? Wow. And we would learn the Bible, and it would say, Abraham stood on this mountain and looked out to this valley and saw this sea, and in New Jersey... I don't know what they're talking what about. Yes. What does it mean? When you're standing here, it's different. And yes. I'll give you one example. Okay. If you look in Psalm 125, written by King David himself. That's right. He's sitting somewhere over here yes. writing this psalm. Mm. And it says, Yerushalayim Harim Savivla. Jerusalem is surrounded by mountains. By now, mountains. that's beautiful terminology and it's really nice and poetic. But let's go beyond that. Yes. If David is here, 
Yeah. And he looks out his window. Yeah. To the north, he sees Mount Moriah. Mm. Right. He looks to the east, he sees the Mount Not of Olives. Yes. He looks to the south, he sees the ridge of Armand and Let's see. He yes. looks to the west, he sees Mount Zion. Wow. Yes. Jerusalem is surrounded mm. by mountains. The right. description that we find in Psalms, mm. in the Bible, it's not just figurative, it's literal. It's literal. But you it appreciate it, it exactly, you right. appreciate it when you're standing here in right. the ancient city of Jerusalem, the city oh. of David, you say, wow, the reason he said Jerusalem is surrounded yes. by mountains yeah. is because it is. <laughs> and it says, Great. and that those that trust Great. in him, yeah. they are secure, mm -hmm. just like those mountains. Exactly. You know, when you look at this today, I mean, we're, we're at a, a lookout point where we could see history, and this is over 5,000 years of history. You're talking about Abram, who becomes Abraham, and he brings his son, and then he says, God will provide. And it's the same place where we also look mm -hmm. at and we see Calvary. God has provided. Right. And for us as Christian, we recognize that this is probably mm -hmm. the most fantastic place because, yes. you know, we see Jesus. this as a, a place of, of absolute reverence. You know, I love talking about Israel, and I remember a, a, a little tiny memory that was never caught on camera when we were there in Israel. But uh, we were, you know, driving down the road, and Brian happened to mention that the town of Nain was sort of uh, in, in a nearby area. And, of course, that reminded me of the story of the woman uh, who was burying her son. She had already lost her husband, and she was burying her son. And Jesus came along at that moment, and seeing her in her crisis and he went over to where the boy was and he said to the mother don't cry and Jesus still said to us says to us don't cry I am the one who can heal and resurrect I can restore everything Jesus is the one that we can trust for all of our uh, difficulties in life today and it was so neat to be in that place where he had actually done that miracle. Just fantastic. You know, coming up next, we have a real treat. We are going to pray with you and uh, Brian is going to share a powerful hope to go from the shores of the Sea of Galilee. You do not want to miss this. Hey, welcome to this Hope To Go. Today I want to talk to you about Mission Possible. On a mission, ordinary just won't do. Have you ever felt like your life just lacked that luster and it lacked that certain something that caused it to really get your giddy up going and get your flag up the pole? Well, today I want to talk to you about living on purpose and being on a mission. You know, this is the same place where Jesus called his early disciples. And after he called those men, he did something so fantastic. He literally released them into the world and they took the world by storm and they turned it upside down. That's what the Bible says said these men have come to us and they are turning the world upside down I want you to get a, a portion of scripture with me where where Jesus starts this call it says in Matthew chapter 4 verse 18 it says and Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee the same sea saw two brothers Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother casting a net into the sea for they were fishermen then he said to them follow me listen to this and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Wow. When you think of this, today that would be like him coming to, to uh, your office or your school or your, your community and he said, come and follow me and I will make you. Did you hear that? This is such a powerful truth because what he's saying is, 
The power is not for you to make you, but it's for God to make you. Because if you make your name great, you've got to keep it great. But if God makes your name great, he will keep it great. So it doesn't matter who you are, God will take the ordinary and make it extraordinary. The call of God is the first thing he does is he gives you a command to come. He says, come unto me, all who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That call to come is a compound word. It's the call, come, and passion. We've got passion, self-directed energy. Energy, his call to come, there's compassion that comes together and miracles always happen. Jesus was moved with compassion. He healed the multitude. Jesus moved with compassion. He gave sight to the blind. This call is so powerful that ordinary just won't do. So you say, what do I have to do? Well, A, in order to get into this supernatural call, you have to be going the same direction as God. And that means that you have to determine who is the boss. Because if you're going in a different direction and God's going in another direction, you're going to be like the reeds behind me, those dead things. That's how we all are before we come to Christ. Our lives are just full of a whole lot of dead end paths. But as soon as Christ comes into our life, as soon as we open up our heart and give him our personal permission for his heavenly intervention, then the great adventure begins to start. But number two, what you got to understand, you got to be going at the same speed. So many people say, oh, I'm ready to go because they're basically just tired of their lives and they want to do something new. It's like changing your hair. You know, when it's come, it's time to do something new so many people look at it as a na next fad or something else but there's other people that they really meditate on that just like Simon Peter did he was the head of a fishing village and he was a man that was responsible for a lot of lives but it was still in that moment when Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee he heard something that he didn't hear before he began to understand that Jesus was speaking his language he said come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Well, I'm a fisherman. I love to fish. I mean, it's great to catch a trout and it's great to catch even, you know, a marlin. Oh, but when you catch a man and you watch that man get cleaned up and sit down and begin to declare that Jesus is Lord and his whole family gets saved. It's been said once before that when a wife is the first one to get saved or even a child is the first one, 3% of their family follow in their faith. When a wife gets saved, it's usually around 30% of their family follow in their faith. But when a man gets saved, 90% of his family follows in his faith. So you've got to be going, number one, the same direction. And you also have to have the same speed. Isaiah 46, 11 says, yes, I have spoken it. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it and I will also do it. You can't run ahead of him and you can't lag behind him. But when you start lunch bucket Christianity, right there when you're washing dishes, when you begin to pray, pray without ceasing, when you begin to get accountability in your life, when you begin to say, yes, I am called because the call of God is the same call of salvation. You got to believe it in your heart and you got to declare it in your mouth that yes, Jesus is Lord. And then the third thing begins to kick into gear. And this is where I love it because this is that high octane. This is methane. This is pure fire. You have to go after the same purpose. Jesus said everything he did that the Father may be glorified. There's a lot of people that are trying to get glory for their own name. But when you do it that the Father may be glorified, my God, fame, they will remember his name. And my Lord, there is a enough uh, there's enough glory for you at the end of the day. This is so important because it speaks of motivation. It speaks of your motive. Why are you coming after him? Just because your, your husband is in a, in a bad mood or just because your children are not following after God? Many times when we go through difficulties, when we look down, we'll find when our foundation is shaken, it's God getting our attention. But he only wants us to get his attention, our attention in order for us to follow him in the same direction, in the same speed, but also with the same purpose. And this is his purpose, that none should perish, but all would come come to repentance. This is so important. I'm going to pray for you right now because I believe that God has a mission for you. I believe everyone has a call in their life. I don't care who you are. There's a gift inside of you, but the gift cannot be released while you're sitting down, but only while you're serving. Come on, pray this prayer with me. It's a dangerous prayer, but I want you to pray this prayer just like Peter, just like Paul, just like all of the apostles that have been here in this place. Come on, pray this prayer. Jesus, be Jesus in me, no longer I, Lord, but thee. Resurrection power, fill me this hour. 
Jesus be Jesus in me. Now, Father, I pray that person that has prayed for that ministry, I pray for the activation of the accumulation of all of the prayer and the power that you have stored up for their lives. And I pray from the sea and the shores of the Galilee that now, God, as you said, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. I pray for the light of your power, the Shekinah glory, the Ruah HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, now to move into that woman, oh God, move into that man move into that family and Lord move them on their mission because ordinary just won't do and that is your hope to go daddy yeah buddy how many nickels are in a dollar there are 20 nickels Look, in a dollar how do birds fly does milk really make my bone stronger yeah yeah Daddy, when we die, will we go to heaven? Do you have the answer to life's biggest question? Call the 700 Club. We'll help you find answers to the important questions life brings your way. Wow, Laura Lynn, what a wonderful time that we've had today. It and, has been. you know, going through Israel, it has just mm -hmm. been one of those magnificent moments, just life changing. Yeah. And for this week only, the 700 Club Canada is offering you this free DVD, and it's in his footsteps. Journey with us as we take you to the places that Jesus walked, where he taught, and where he performed those many miracles you've heard of. And you can see the incredible view of the Sea of Galilee and take a walk around the Garden Tomb as well. All you have to do, give us a call, 1-855-759-0700. It's absolutely free. Give us a call today. Today, we enjoy praying for you, but we want to pray for Israel today because the Bible said that those who love you will prosper. And we want you right now in this moment to pray with us and let's believe God that he's going to cause Canada to prosper, but you to prosper as well. Yes. Father, we thank you that your word says that you will prosper those that love you. And we repent now in Canada for anti-Semitism. And Lord, those, those spirits inside of our hearts that say, Lord, why them and not us? Lord, you chose, and because you chose, we choose your choice in the name of Jesus. And pray for the peace of Israel, the peace of Jerusalem. May you bless the Knesset. May you bless that land, Father, that land that you're going to call all the nations back to. And we ask now that the blessing of the Lord would come upon our viewers according to Numbers 6 and 26. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom, his mm. peace. Mm. Amen. We come Amen. into agreement with that. Thank you. Amen. We have a power verse to leave you with. It says, God said to him, your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. Genesis 35:10. God bless. Thanks for joining us today. God bless you.